you know you can sort of uh, sort of visualize the the access cavity more and you can see here now it's starting to take shape a little bit you get this kind of um, sort of triangleish form but there is a, still a bit of an undercut over here and what you know you've got to argue as well so hello welcome to this Friday's clinical case um, we're going to do a bit something a bit different today. We always do something different, but we're going to do something a bit different today. We're going to give you uh, an idea of how to access a central or a lateral incisor uh, perfectly. And um, this is a bit of a hybrid case today because I have got a an extracted tooth. We're going to talk about how to do the initial access, and then I'm going to move over to a real world case. And the reason why I'm using an extracted uh, tooth today is because I forgot to press the record button on this uh, on this particular case and usually if I forget to press the record button I just move on to a different case but I just felt as we were doing this case it just it was just too good to be uh, to, 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 to not hit the channel so this is the one of the reasons why I'm doing it on the extracted tooth and um, what I want to do is before we start I just want to say that um, you know when we look at the channel analytics and we look at the types of people that are watching these videos we've got people from all over the world world but what I would say is what's, what's really striking is that around 50 to 60 percent of people that watch these videos are not subscribed so if I could just ask you one favor it takes you th 30 se three seconds it takes you three seconds it takes you half a second just to press that subscribe button if you could it's a really really simple free and easy way to support the channel and I promise if you press that subscribe button each video, each week, would you be getting better and better and better? And I'll just thank you in advance for that. So I just want to look at the case first before we start. Um, this is a case of a upper uh, left one. Okay, notwithstanding the upper left two, it's also got a poor root canal associated with it and possibly got apical infection. Today we're going to just uh, just concentrate on the upper one. I believe this tooth was knocked um, when she was younger, I think, and and maybe it's further compounded by this large large um, uh, composite filling that's been placed um, after the fact, but. We look at this now, and this uh, root canal is massive, okay? You've got to ask yourself, you know, if you're missing this during access, then, you know, you need to go to spec savers, or you need to get your eyes tested. But um, I think what's important in this case is is to, to access this tooth is, is probably really, really easy. You know, to get inside the root canal is easy. But if you want to access it uh, properly, and what's in the patient's best interest, there's a little bit of a technique to that. So what we're going to do is I'm going to move over to this extracted tooth and we can see here that um, this this is a central incisor and I'm just going to draw on the central incisor here just a, a, a roundabout area where you're going to sort of aim your fast hand piece and you're going to sort of aim it in the singulum area but in this case this this tooth hasn't got a singulum and um, what also you're going to do is you're going to angle the burr in a kind of a 45 degree angle so what you're not going to do in this case you're not going to go straight for the straight line access straight away because what you'll do is especially in a, in a, in a younger younger person if you get try and get straight straight line access with this you're going to have to go through the incised ledge which is going to compromise the aesthetic so as you can see here with our fast hand piece I am just accessing this at a kind of a maybe a 45 degree angle and then we're going to we're not just going to go gunko straight in we're going to just access the tooth we're going to very very uh, carefully create like an uh, like a like a circle shape so we're going to drill just a tiny little bit, we're going to pull it away, and then we're just going to have a little bit of an investigation with our probe, okay? We're going to see if we've got any kind of catch, because as soon as we've got a catch, that's when we change tack, okay? So in this case, um, the, 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 the pulp chamber isn't exposed just yet. We're going to cut the tooth a bit more with our fast hand piece. And again, we're just going to pull it out, have a little fiddle around with our probe here. And again, we haven't really got a, a breach here of the pulp chamber. And then we're going to do just a tiny little bit more. So we're going to just do it in steps. We're not going to, like I say, go to gung-ho. And we can see here, as I drill into the tooth, we get this kind of like um, this drop feeling. So we know now we're into the canal space. And we know now that um, that, that that I've breached uh, the, the the pulp. And I'm going to use a, a high-energy ultrasonic just to, just to make sure that I'm... Um, opening up this kind of breach in the access cavity and we are ready just to do a little bit of fine tuning with our with our fast hand piece better be super super careful in this case that you don't kind of over prep uh, the inside of the tooth you don't sort of drill out more than you should do and then you can see here now that we it's not pretty 
but we're in, okay? And it's at this point um, we move over to the clinical case. This again, this is from a young lady. We can see there's an obvious breach here. But at this point, the access cavity is not finished. I suppose you could ask yourself, well, you know, I'm in, so why, why, do, why do I need to um, uh, change tack? Well, what you need to do, first of all, is you need to remove, in this case, the palatal shelf. So the palatal shelf is kind of this kind of bump which is uh, uh, palatally, which is gonna uh, impede your straight access. And in this case, what I tend to use is a low energy ultra diamond tipped ultrasonic. Um, I recognize that if you're not into endodontics, you're not gonna have these. You can kind of do this with a fast hand piece, but you gotta be super, super, super careful. And once you remove this palatal shelf, you can see now you've got a bit more straight line access with, access with your vision. And the next thing you need to be doing here is you need to remove the pulpal horns. So at the moment, the access cavity actually is more circular, but you're gonna need to make it a more triangular. And the reason why you want to remove uh, the pulp horns is because it's got necrotic tissue in there. And obviously this is a source of uh, bacterial infection, um, you know, but, but really what it is, it is just an area where it's difficult for you to fill and it can discolor the tooth over a long period of time. Time. And you can see here that I'm just feeling for the nice kind of undercut of uh, the, the, the sort of pulpal horns here. And I'm just um, refining the access cavity with these diamond tip ultrasonic burrs. And um, you know, like I say, you can use a fast hand piece. Uh, the, the problem with that, of course, is um, you know you, you don't have a lot of control over this. So these 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 do take a bit more time, but you've got better vision, and you can you know you can sort of uh, sort of visualize the the access cavity more. And you can see here now it's starting to take shape a little bit, getting this kind of um, sort of triangleish form. But there is a, still a bit of an undercut over here. And what, you know, you've got to argue as well about minimal preps and things. Um, you know, you could you could argue that me, um, uh, uh, you know, adjusting this axial cavity, I'm, I'm removing a lot of tooth tissue, but I think in my case, and this patient's case is best if we open it all up all nicely. And we can see here that once we've cleaned it all out, we've got a really, really nice triangular shaped access cavity. We've got nice straight line access and we've removed all that kind of necrotic tissue, which is seen in the crown. So once we've accessed the tooth, I know that the apex is really, really nice and wide, and I'm gonna go straight for my working length measurement with my apex locator. I'm using a size 15K file here, and you know, if you see in a lot of my videos, ad nauseum, I say this all the time, I'm gonna push the K file through the apex, so the apex locator screams like it's through, and then I'm gonna back uh, the file up until I hit zero, and that is my uh, zero reading. And when we pull it out, we can see the working length here is found to be 20 uh, millimeters. And I'm not gonna bother with any glide path files. I know that the canal's really large. So I'm gonna go straight for my uh, 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 my shaping files here. I'm using a Hyflex 25. I'm measuring it, of course, 0.5 millimeters away from the zero reading. And this uh, rotary file just drops straight down to the working length, really, really nice and easy. But I'm getting a little bit of friction there, so I know that I'm shaping it. I don't need to increase my shaping sizes anymore. And then we're gonna do a little bit of irrigation. And again, you know, it's at this point, I suspect that the apical diameter of this uh, tooth is wide. So I'm gonna get my gutter cutter here and I'm just gonna have a little sort of feel around to get a bit of a gut feeling that it's probably about 50. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut the end of my GP cone to 50. So now the end of the GP is a size uh, 50 ISO. And I'm gonna just get my, uh, my measuring block here and I'm just gonna make sure that I measure the GP cone. So it's, um, it's at the working length minus 0.5 millimeters. And I'm just gonna crimp the GP cone at that point. So as I push this GP cone to length, I see that it fits really, really snugly at the inside legend. This is really, really lucky. I don't usually get it on the first go, but um, um, luckily we found that the, the apical diameter of this tooth is, uh, is, is ISO 50. And my assistant here has forgotten to get the, uh, the radiographic holder out. And you can see here that she's got some crazy, crazy shoes on. And, um, um, you know, I don't like to take my endodontic um, uh, x-rays, especially my anterior ones, with a normal endodontic holder. I feel like it kind of just gets in the way with, 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 unless of course I've got a file or some sort of thing in the canal space when I'm taking an x-ray, I feel like the normal x-ray holders just work just as well. And also I like to do is I like to help the nurse in orientating the x-ray when they're putting their x-ray through the machine. One of the most annoying things that I find, um, 
with uh, with endodontics is I have given the uh, you know the X-ray to the to the nurse. She's put it through the uh, the machine, and then it's upside down or it's the wrong way around. And I work in certain practices where it's really really difficult for you to orientate the X-ray. So what I do here is I use the dot to top method. So you can see here on the X-ray, um, there is like a little dot, and I'm going to make sure that that little dot sits um upwards so if i'm doing a doing it doing it doing a um a, an upper tooth i'm going to make sure that the dot is facing apically and the patient can see the dot on the x-ray as it's um as, as it's going through so she can orientate that really nice easy and you know we're going to take the rubber dam um frame off we're going to fold the dam so we can kind of see the clamp and then i'm going to place the uh the x-ray holder in place here and then get the patient just to bite on it perfectly. And the patient's got a small mouth, so she's she's struggling a little bit, but she's doing really, really, really well. And while the X-ray is getting developed, what I like to do is like to set up. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna place um, some sodium hypochlorite into my uh, GP disinfecting ring. I'm also gonna use some EDTA, seventeen percent. Um, and also I'm going to use isopropyl alcohol. And if we look at the cone fit radiograph, we can see that the cone fit radiograph is within the radiographic apex. So it's not all the way to the end, but what we've done is we've measured this with our apex locator and we know that this is the, 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 the portal of exit. This is actually the end of the tooth. So don't be too concerned if the GP isn't always at the end. You want to be trusting your apex locator. And then we're ready to do our final Final irrigation on our disinfectant. I'm just going to push out the uh, GP cone and I'm going to place that in our sodium hypochlorite. And then I'm going to do my final irrigation protocol. Again, same as before, same as every video. We're using sodium hypochlorite. We're going to activate this with our um, endodontic activation. Um, I'm using an 18th uh, endo activator here. So this just vibrates all the nastiness out of the canal. And I'm going to just place some of the excess sodium hypochlorite in a different well. I'm going to suck up the 17% uh, 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 EDTA and same sort of thing. We're going to irrigate the tooth. We're going to activate the tooth. We're going to irrigate, activate, irrigate, activate, just until the irrigation runs nice and clear. And then our final um, irrigation step is going to be with the sodium hypochlorite. I've used all of the 17% EDTA. I'm going to suck up some of the uh, sodium hypochlorite. And then again, same same thing. We're going to irrigate the canal space. We're going to activate. And like I say, if you if you don't own a, an irrigant activator and you buy one, you will see how clean it gets the canals. So um, once you've used one, you'll never not use one ever again. And then we're ready to dry our, uh, our canal space. Some of our eagle-eyed uh, viewers here will can see that these paper points are not um, sterile. Um, but, um, you know... <laughs> It's 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 a bone of contention between endodontists and a lot of the time what I like to use is I like to use a sterile wave one gold uh, paper points but in this case I know that the the canal space is really really wide so I'm just using these wider um, uh, paper points and what we're going to do here is we're going to make sure that the uh, the canal space is super super nice and dry. And then I'm ready to uh, get everything set up, ready for our obturation. I, um, I'm really concerned about um, extrusion in this case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my uh, visco tip, which uh, introduces the biostromic to the canal space, and I'm just going to measure it. So what I don't want to do is I don't want to um, directly inject uh, this biostromic into the canal um, too far down, but I obviously want to get enough of the uh, biostromic into the canal um, so it fills everything, because this is quite a wide canal, and I think that placing uh, the biostromic in the mid coronal third is probably going to have a few voids apically, so I'm going to make sure that I am filling this tooth from top to bottom um, within reason, of course, we've got to be really, really careful. And then we're just going to get our hand file, get that nice and dry um, and put that to one side. And then my nurse is unusually going to get some accessory cones out. I'm slightly concerned about the size of this uh, this canal space. So even though I'm using a bioceramic, there's a possibility I'm going to have to push some GP cones in between the master apical cone just 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 in case it doesn't fill it adequately and then we're ready to go with our obturation i'm going to pick up the uh the master cone here i'm going to dip it in isopropyl alcohol this is going to get rid of all the uh, sodium hypochlorite and then i'm going to air dry it and then once that's crimped in 
while this air dried, that GP comes ready to be uh, introduced into the canal space. And then before we get going, I'm just going to disinfect these accessory cones. And it actually transpires eventually that I don't actually use these um, these accessory cones. But um, it's always good to have kind of a bit of a backup. Always be ready for the for the for the for the unexpected. And then um, you know I've got everything ready to go. I'm going to pick up my uh, my my one fill. I'm going to introduce the one fill. Uh, to you know the quite quite deep into this tooth and I'm going to fill it up quite significantly uh, this tooth with with my bioceramic again got to be super careful when you're doing that without mag magnification I'm going to then introduce my disinfected file almost to the working length so that what this does is it introduces the bioceramic to the whole length of the tooth but also it stops that vapor lock when I push the GP cone to length. And again, the GP cone's ready just to pick up. I'm going to place this really, really gently to length because there's a possibility that we get that kind of vapor lock within the tooth. And, um, you know, you're either not going to push the GP cone adequately to length or you're going to push some of the sealer significantly out the end. So again, we're just going to really, really, really gently just push it to length. It is bobbing up and down a little bit, but um, we can see here that, you know, it, it is advancing nicely. And we check that the, the cone has been cut off at the right length and we know that the cone has been seated properly because when you've got um, a sealer in there sometimes it's difficult to feel for that tug back and also you don't want to feel the tug back when you're going to be pushing the sealer out the end and this is where I just check the accessory cones okay so I'm just going to take one of the accessory cones out I'm going to dip that into isopropyl alcohol I'm going to dry it off and as I try and sort of push this down the side of the tooth it's it's impossible so um, we know that this tooth's been adequately filled we're gonna uh, then remove the excess GP and then what's really really important in this case is that you're removing the GP or the obturation material below the level of the CEJ and this is really significantly important because if you don't do this what you'll tend to happen and find is that over a very, very long period of time, uh, the GP and the, the sealer or whatever can stain the crown. And, and the amount of really, really stained crowns that I see in practice where the GP's kind of been filled almost up into the to, into the crown itself. So you have got to make sure that you're pushing this down to length. Also, of course, when, it, you know, if this tooth was, say, was getting, uh, you know, some internal bleaching, you want to make sure that you're cutting it enough below the CEJ so you can get a kind of like a bit of a cap on there so that so there's enough sort of um, surface area for the inside of the tooth to be whitened adequately and overall you know we look at the post-op radiograph and it looks really nice you know I suppose we've got a little bit of um, uh, extrusion here I I am almost certain that isn't a GP point through the I think that is uh, that sealer but you we can see here that the uh, the root canal is well filled we've got a solid molar block of uh, sealer and GP and overall really 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 nice result and um, you know if you like this video please please like and subscribe um, it's a really, really easy way to support the channel. And if you want to take that support even further, we've got a membership program. The membership program is a small monthly fee. It's ran by YouTube. If you go on our YouTube channel, you can see how you can become a member. And the great thing about membership is you're supporting the channel. You're keeping me independent, but also you get early access to content. So if you can't get enough of these videos, you want early access to content. I usually work about three weeks ahead. And, um, and, and you get to see them early. And overall, thanks for watching and I'll see you next week in the next video. Bye-bye.